Hello everyone, you're listening to the Dougie Sharp Podcast. My guest today is an experimental bass artist whose album 11th Hour, released on Space Yacht, has garnered over 2 million streams on Spotify since its release three years ago, and his recent single, The Dark, featuring Josiah and Whipped Cream, has been streamed over a million times on Spotify. It's Crimson Child, aka Yashar Tafazoli. Thanks so much for coming in today, man. Thanks for having me, dude. Nice. It's good to good to see you. It's been uh, quite a few years since we last saw each other. Yeah, I feel like two, three years. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was quite a wild it was, <laughs> encounter. Yeah, yeah. Very chance. Yeah. 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 I know you wanted to talk about that one a little bit, so I'll let you lead into it. Yeah, it was a it was a funny night. Um, I don't remember exactly like how it started. I just remember that we ended up in this Uber that you were driving, yeah. myself and a couple uh, friends of mine. And we were going to uh, my buddy Moonsun's place for a little party. Yeah. And uh, you were driving us and we got into this conversation. Like, we were just chatting it up. And once we got there, we, like, invited you up to come to this <laughs> yeah. party. And, uh, yeah, you came and we were so happy. It was, like, such a weird, like, just unexpected thing. Um, and I, the thing that really stood out to me was when we got upstairs, it was, like, maybe, like, 30 dudes yeah. in there. And just, like... That's just how it kind of got composed because we came from like a different party first. Um, and so <laughs> I remember you you said to like one of my friends and then they told me afterwards that like as soon as you got up, the first thing you mentioned was your girlfriend. Just so everyone knew that it wasn't like that you weren't there for like that kind of party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought that was really funny. And uh, yeah, we just like DJ techno for a bit and yeah. hung out. And yeah, now years later. Here we are. Here we are, man. Yeah. yeah. That was a funny, that was honestly for me as an Uber driver, like the fun, one of the funniest, <laughs> one of the funniest experiences I had. Just boys are like, we're going to have a party. You want to come have some drinks? And I was like, oh, it's like 2.30 in the morning. Like I may as <laughs> well head up and head up and see what's up. And it was a cool vibe, man. It was, um, you guys were kind of moving through too. Like you and Moonsan mm -hmm. were just coming into kind of your own as artists. I feel like I, like, I think you were just about to drop. 11th hour yeah it was right before it pretty much yeah. um that was a that was a weird time that we the party we came from was actually this guy uh vanik's place mm. he was just moving to denver he's like one of my earliest inspirations musically yeah uh like when i was 14 15 like getting into music production my mom cut out newspaper clippings about vanik because he's like True. a vancouver artist yeah um and i got like super obsessed with his music and then like Years later, I became friends with him through Moonsun. And yeah. Um, yeah, so that was happening. And then at the same time, I had just finished my album and was about to drop it. And Moonsun was also writing so much music. So I felt like it was just like a very like transitional time for me creatively. Yeah. And so it just felt kind of like like that was a night, you know, like yeah. it stands out of my memory. I feel like my memory, uh, I'm jumping all over the place here, but my memory yes. is like really, really good for like music. Yeah. I like I remember songs and artists really well but it's really bad with time and mm. like events and things that have happened. Like most things I feel like are just like a blur for me in the last few years, especially. Yeah. Um, so when nights like stand out like that and I remember them like very clearly, that's like, it has significance for me. Yeah. Yeah. It was so, dude, I have a very similar feeling of that night as well, where it was cool. Like looking around at like, you guys are quite a bit younger than me, but it was like yourself and Moonsan, And it was just like, these guys are going to go. You know, like mm -hmm. before I left, I made sure I got everyone's Instagram because <laughs> I was so curious to see where you guys were heading mm -hmm. because you just had that vibe about you. Like it was just like something's going to happen with these guys. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really driven. They're really creative. They're very interesting. Like they're they're going to go somewhere. And like, I really want to see where it goes. And it's been super fun, like keeping track with you guys on Instagram being mm -hmm. like, they did it. They did it. They actually went and, and got after it. And like, it's been very, very fun to watch. Yeah. But as you were actually just leaving to, like, you're a very talented musician, but also quite a talented artist as well, right? You were going to Spain for an art residency. Yeah, yeah. I went and uh, did some painting in Spain. My uh, Part of my family lives in Spain now, actually. Okay. So my mom and my youngest brother live there. Uh, so that was part of it, too, to just to go visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's an artist that I worked with for my albums uh, for my album cover mm -hmm. uh, about three four years ago his name is Mario Rodriguez very very talented artist and actually blew up quite a bit more right after I worked with him so nice. if I wanted to get that same album cover it would probably be like triple quadruple the price now yeah. um, but he's a Barcelona based artist uh, very very talented guy and like when I saw his work right away connected with me I was like this is what I want for my album mm -hmm. and the cover he came up with too was like kind of a collaborative process like he gave some 
a uh, couple pieces that I then picked from and then made some suggestions. And like there was a big back and forth on the use of red because mm. he doesn't use red at all in his work. And then I convinced him, please use like a tiny bit of red in this piece. Like it's just, it's my color. And after he did, it was like perfect and he loved it too. And it just came together like so beautifully. And when I wanted to go to Spain to visit my family, I was like, I'm, I need to go work with Mario for a bit. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out like after I booked the trip, you know, months in advance, when it came time to actually go, he got offered this like huge like exhibition tour basically. And he came to Vancouver even oh. and did a show over here. Like he's gone a lot bigger since then. Uh, and so I ended up working with his teacher. Okay. Uh, this guy named Cesar uh, Biojo, who's also insanely talented. And so my life in Barcelona for those like five weeks, I was like nocturnal the whole time basically. And I was just going to the studio every night and just switching between painting and writing music. And Sweet. that was a really, really cool time in my life, actually. Yeah, I miss that quite a bit. Yeah. Are you still painting now? Uh, I do it a lot less now. Like, music kind of picked up a lot more in the last couple of years. And that's, like, definitely been my main focus mm. for the last, I don't know, since I got into creative work. Like, music was always, like, I put the blinders on, in a sense. Yeah. Painting was really nice for me because it's, like, still a creative act, but it's away from a screen. Yeah. Because many of my other hobbies are also, like, screen related. So just spending time away from looking at a monitor, but still doing something creative is like really helpful for me. Yeah. And it's something I really want to get back into. Mm. Uh, but in the last like year and a half or so, no, I haven't been doing as much and I do miss it yeah. for sure. But I mean, your, your artistry definitely bleeds into your music videos. Like the, um, the dark music video mm -hmm. and the Crowfisher music video are both pretty insane. Yeah. Like, um, I loved the use of like generative AI mm -hmm. in the Crowfisher mm -hmm. and then the dark, how, how did you guys film that one? Was it the like the 3D screens, like the LED panel screens behind you, or was it all green screen? It was or? all motion capture. Yeah, we it, there's a room. There's basically a studio called the Departure Lounge mm -hmm. that operates out of Emily Carr. Oh, okay. So that's the art school in Vancouver for people who don't know, and they have this whole setup. It's like what you see, like how they film like Avatar, where there's yeah. like a whole full like green screen room and like 50 cameras pointing at the center and you can just do anything in there and they'll like put you in a space basically. Whoa. Um, so I had a lot less like creative direction on that video specifically just because the scale was a lot bigger. The artists we were working with, you know, whipped cream, Josiah, and it was really her vision, whipped creams. Uh, and I was just there to like really facilitate and help where I could and have my little appearance in the video. Um, but that, and that was a really cool experience to work with. But Crowfisher, I think, is like a different because uh, it's from my album and it took way longer. Like mm. the dark video was put together in maybe a year, probably okay. less than that. And the Crowfisher video start to finish was like three years. No way. Yeah, yeah. It wow. was like a year of pre-production, year of shooting, year of post. Wow. Um, and the AI part that you mentioned wasn't even in the whole plan until that last year. Hmm. Like the vision for it evolved a lot from where we started to where, what it ended up being. And even the idea of, to do a music video for that initially, it was pitched to me by um, Ruzbe Pekari, who's uh, the uh, founder of Red Rose Films. And he like really led the whole kind of journey for creating that video. He approached me with the idea for that video before the album had even come out. Oh, really? Okay. So we didn't know that Crowfisher was going to be the biggest song from the album. You know, it, that was just the song that connected with him the most visually that he could see a video for. And so we already started planning that before it came out. And then it just so happened that when we put out that single, it surpassed the first single, Consecration, right away. Just had a kind of took on a life of its own, mm. and even now, like people who find my music, they'll either find me through like God Rays, which was a single from like years before that, or Crowfisher is generally one of the two songs that people will find me from. And so it just worked out so perfectly that that was the one that we were already planning a video for, and so really wanted to do it justice. Yeah, um, and worked with a lot of amazing people. We had like 30 people on set at one point when we did the piano in the water yeah. scenes. Um, so that just felt like like really like taking a step forward in terms of the scale of production yeah. of what we were making. And it was really nice to kind of be in that creative seat for something visual, which I'm not really used to. Like I do the painting and stuff, but mm. generally like my field is audio. And so getting into this other side of things and being able to feel like I have influence on that, like that was a really good experience. Yeah. I, I loved the video, man. It's gorgeous. Thank it's you. super gorgeous. And the, the piano and the water stuff and, getting to see it all come together because you were kind of teasing it a little bit throughout your story. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder what this is going to end up <laughs> looking like. And it was 
it was really nice when it finally came out and i was like wow they did a great job with this Thank you. yeah funny yeah. thing about the piano in the water is we wanted to light it on fire actually okay and we did try to it was like a very controlled kind of burn or whatever but that was right at the peak of the big wildfires in bc mm. and so you can even see in the shot like how smoky it is in the background which when we showed up to set that day like there was a lot of panic around that of like oh the shot's not gonna look good but it ended up working so well like to create this kind of ethereal other world compared to like the plot of the music video to kind of cut between the two yeah but yeah when we when it came time to light the fire we had the marshals on us like immediately oh yeah yeah and they were like watching very closely to make sure we didn't light any more fires and so um <laughs> we had to abandon that part of it and we even came back to like light the piano on fire like a different day or whatever and at that point it was completely destroyed like the water had the tide had come in and sweeped it. it up so next time we'll do that uh and kind of take it a step further but yeah yeah no, right. that was cool for sure it was it was gorgeous man and you were you ended up playing some shows when you were in spain as well uh in spain it was mostly just like a residency like for painting and and, and music i went to a lot of shows went on that track on that yeah. trip um actually yeah so you're kind of right. Not in Spain. I ended up going to London afterwards for a week. Okay. And then from London, I went to Germany. And in Germany, I played a show at Boots House Cologne, which is my favorite club in the world. Yeah. Like, I can talk about this club forever because uh, from when I was like 11, 12 years old, I was watching the YouTube videos of the sets there. Yeah. And just getting so obsessed. Like, it's like the craziest crowd you've ever seen. They're like constantly super high energy. Um, and just the room is insane. Like they're shooting fire from the ceilings and like, it's just a crazy space. And the first time I went was, uh, on a graduation trip right after your, um, high school. Yeah. I went with my boys who, you know, uh, yeah, Danny yeah. and Jonathan, shout out to the boys. Uh, we went to Europe together right after graduating and I like, pushed super hard for us to go like quite far out of our way to go to Cologne for a day so I could check out this club. Yeah. Uh, and then this was my second time going because uh, a friend was playing a show there. Okay. It was Inhumans uh, Showcase. And then the day before, like two days before the show, I got hit up to uh, and asked if I wanted to close out the night. I was like, yes, of course. This is my favorite club ever. Uh, and that was a like, really amazing experience to nice. go and actually play there. Like, Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny you mentioned like clubs because club culture is so interesting globally, but mm. how would you say it compares to Vancouver? Because <laughs> I, yeah, that's, that was the reaction I was expecting. <laughs> it's a, it's kind of bad around here and you know, I've never actually been inside a club in Vancouver mm. because I end up just looking at the lines and being like, I'm out of here. But having spent so much time like in Asia and traveling around, like there's incredible clubs everywhere and such diverse sounds and mm -hmm. music and how is it, you know, being a DJ in Vancouver with kind of a whack club scene? Like, I don't really know what to call it, but. Well, I haven't experienced it in Asia, but with Europe specifically, it's night and day for yeah. sure. It's just not at all similar. I feel like the biggest difference is that in Vancouver and North America in general, it's a lot more about the atmosphere in terms of like lighting, production, visuals, just everything that surrounds the night, but the music itself. Mm. It can be about the music, but I feel like club nights specifically, it's a lot about like just going out to have a party. Yeah. And that's what most people care about, which is fine too. That's why most of the time when I go to shows here, I won't just like go to a club. I'll go to like a show of a specific artist. Mm. But even then I feel like, and this is not always the case, but a lot of the time it's just like phones in the air and kind of people are not as invested in the, in the kind of the narrative of the set and really kind of soaking into it. And the shows that do the best here are the ones with the craziest visuals. Because hmm. that's what like appeals to people the most. Um, there are exceptions to this. Like actually I was really pleasantly surprised by um, like I think a month or two ago, I went to Night Punk and Abstract at Sick, yeah. Celebrities. And Night Punk's one of my favorite artists right now. He's insane. And that show was really good in terms of the crowd actually. I was really impressed because I was thinking about it going in. I was like, I don't know how like Night Punk's gonna go over in Vancouver because mm. his music's so high energy. It's a lot faster too. He plays a lot of drum and bass, which generally doesn't do as well here. So I was really surprised with like how positive the reception was in the crowd. Everyone was really invested. And to see that at a club like Celebrities too, that was just a really cool experience. And it gave me kind of hope for Vancouver's music scene moving forward. I was like, maybe things are changing now. Yeah. Like we've had enough of the kind of insane production of the, the visuals and the lights. And now people are kind of getting back into the yeah, music the side music. of things. Yeah. That's my hope. Mm. Um, but in Europe, they, I feel like they've just had it for a lot longer. Yeah. And so they've kind of gotten over that hump of being just blown away by lasers. And so it's like deeply ingrained in the culture of the people there. 
uh, and you can see it in your in their faces, in where people are looking when they're at a show, and just the type of music that's being played there as well. Like techno is my, like that's my life oh, yeah? of blood. You know, I yeah. love techno, and Europe is the place to go to for those kinds of shows. Like it's just not the same here. Yeah. So yeah, every time I go, I try to go yeah, <laughs> as yeah. many shows as I can. Europe is very high on my list just for music. Yeah. Like specifically for music, especially like UK drum and bass is mm-hmm. like. I would love to be able to go get like super ingrained in that scene and like spend some time just going out to those shows because we just don't really have it here. No. And I'm curious how much like the uh, like the forest rave aspect mm. that we have here is like affected that. Like, you know, you talk about visuals and like craziness, like you go to Shambhala and it's just like insane. And mm-hmm. I always find it funny when you have like a DJ who's like, it's all about the music. And you're yeah. like, is it though? <laughs> you know, like, is it all about the music? So... Yeah, I don't know. I, I would love to see more uh, more shows in Vancouver that are just, yeah, not so much about, like, phones in the air. And yeah. Like, eh, hands in the air. And more about, like, the actual music and what's what's Definitely. being played behind the decks. Yeah, I think it's it's up to, like, bookers and promoters to bring the right artists. But it's also up to the crowds. It's up to, like, the people kind of to, to get their head around, like, what it is that you're going to a show for mm. in the first place. Um, there are some shows coming up that I'm really excited for. I yeah. can give some quick shout outs. ISO XO is coming to Vancouver in March. I don't know if you know him. Not familiar, no. Oh, dude, it's so good. I-, I went to Seattle to see him, and that was like one of the craziest shows I've ever seen. I expected Seattle actually to be kind of similar to Vancouver just because of proximity, mm. but it's also kind of night and day. Like, really? The crowds in Seattle are nuts. Yeah. Like, the, just the energy is very, very high there. So if you see an artist that's coming that um, is only going to play in Seattle or something, I recommend going down and just seeing how different it is there. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's coming. And then the next night is Excision, which is like Ooh, the peak yeah, of like yeah, just yeah. crazy visuals. But his openers are whole into Space Laces. And Space Laces is like my favorite. I'm with you on that. Uh, yeah. Bass music artist ever. So anytime he's around, I'll go see him. Yeah. And I'm very excited for both of those. Uh, yeah, coming up in March. Sick. Excision's interesting, like coming out of Kelowna, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, yeah right yeah. nearby. And he was uh, studying for a long time. Like very, very interesting story, that guy. And like how he kind of eventually broke into the scene and then was just like, ah, I can just do this like full time versus, uh, versus studying. No, he's been around forever. He's been like uh, doing this like touring for like 12, 13 years now. I, I even think of excision more as like a corporation now than like a really? guy, like the amount of money that guy brings in, not just like the, sh- his music, but they're doing festivals, right? They do base Canyon and lost lands, like the two biggest base festivals in us. And then merch, like the amount of merch they move is like I I can't think of any artist who does more, um, really, in terms of merch and then the festival side of things too. Like it's really a business. Yeah, how they have it set up. So yeah, a lot of respect for what he's built. Well, it would make sense because if I remember correctly, that's what he was studying at school. I didn't even know that that business. he was studying. Yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm off, but yeah, I totally remember uh, yeah, right. hearing that he was studying and studying in Kelowna, and then the music side of things kind of took off, and so he went that way versus. Uh, going into business, which has worked out really well for him Definitely. and everyone else. Um, I might have to fact check myself on and that it's, after this. And it's brought up the scene in a way too. Like I feel like him achieving like this kind of mainstream success, like he's really good about putting on smaller artists mm. and giving them that kind of spotlight. Like when he comes here, he's doing two days of uh, shows of his own headline. But the if you look at the lineups, like there are some big artists, but there's some a lot of like really underground bass music that I know he picks himself. Mm. And like, I just really respect that a lot. Like, I feel like if I got to that point where Excision is, like that's what I would want to do too. Yeah. It's just put on the underground and like give them that room to share their art in a way that they haven't had that like platform before, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Spread them, spread them around, get pe- more people to know their name and exactly. hopefully break them out into the the mainstream i mean that's where i feel like the cool shit is like always in the underground right and yeah. um yeah no exactly yeah, you yeah. hit the nail on the head i mean that's that's what i've always loved about like rave culture is like i don't really want to go to like this big kind of like overproduced or in a field is like i want to be like in a forest mm-hmm. under a bridge in like a dirty sweaty warehouse yeah. you know like you don't know the track you don't know the dj but you're just like this this bangs like this no, slaps absolutely. like that's totally where i'm at with electronic music is just yeah i know. think i think i used to be more on the mainstream side of things like as a kid i was just blown away by festivals in the first place and the scale of it and the production mm. and like the size of the crowds but i think i'm more on your side of things now like i really enjoy like intimate club sets yeah the most when you're like right up next to the artist and you can see their face as opposed to a festival where they're way over there all yeah. the way up here there's just this disconnect between the audience and the crowd or sorry the audience and the artist whereas in these club sets like it's this 
direct connection between what this guy is playing and what everyone is kind of receiving. And I feel like in like an underground room like that, like there is no like better way to experience like really good electronic music. Yeah. Like that. It's probably why the boiler rooms have done mm -hmm. so well, like time after time after time is they're just like very small intimate clubs where it's and like no production no visuals no lights really it's just yeah. about the music and uh and their whole concept has caught on a lot like the whole 360 set thing that's happening all over the place now. yeah with people all over the mm -hmm. dj there have been some incredible sets that have come out of the boiler rooms like yeah. absolutely uh incredible the uh chasen status set oh yeah yeah i just saw that huge yeah. huge fan of that one too many pullbacks though <laughs> Dude, I was like, Dude, stop I mean, that's part of the the uk culture though like yeah, you'll definitely experience that when you go there i think it can get a little cheesy when they they do it too many times but it's definitely pretty hype like when it's done right tastefully yeah i think like two or three a set is like that's the right number that's the right number it yeah it's yeah. like i never do it actually the pullbacks they, i feel like in the west they don't get it like yeah it's it's not as much of a and when I say West I mean like North America like there's not as much of a oh like big reaction to the pullback itself because you know what's coming of like they're gonna play it again yeah whereas when you see in Europe they do it, like people understand like the context and the culture of it and it adds to the energy when it's done tastefully yeah yeah fair enough one of your big shows in Vancouver uh, tell me if I'm remembering this correctly you stood in for Akali. Uh, no, I think you're, uh, I did stand in for someone, but it was not a Cali. I think you're, are you thinking of the monster cat compound? I am thinking about that. Yes. Yeah. So that was supposed to be a killer. Actually. Oh, yeah. Pretty close. close. I can see how you got it wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sh uh, she's a great artist. I really love her music a lot. And she was going to be headlining this monster cat compound. Uh, it was two summers ago. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't know, we have this free block party in Vancouver every year hosted by monster cat. Um, like they're one of the biggest electronic music labels in the world and they're based here. So just right outside their offices, they do this free block party and it's been growing like substantially every year. I couldn't go this year because I was touring at the same time. Um, but I've heard that they scaled it up a lot. Like the side stage was as big as the main stage last year. Sick. So it keeps getting bigger. I don't know how much they can expand being yeah. a block party, but uh, it's a really cool part of like what we do here in Vancouver every year. I think it's one of the coolest events that happens and just the energy of it is really cool. Um, so yeah, it was like two or three days before, and I, I guess there's this pattern of me getting hit up for shows like two, three days before it's supposed to happen. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, Caroline whipped cream who gave me the call, who said that they were like, Kayla got sick, like COVID was going around. Right. And, uh, they asked me to step in and I was like, of course like, yeah. I would love to. And it was like amazing. It was one of the best experiences yeah. I've ever had just like playing to that many people. And I haven't played to that many people since it was like 1500 or so outdoors and just the energy was really high in general like i remember i was playing the side stage so it was like four house acts before me mm -hmm. like obviously i'm doing a very different thing than that but i like tried to open with like house music to kind of bridge the gap a little bit um and there was this moment where like there was definitely people at the front who kind of went away like knowing that the, the style had kind of changed but then this like new flood of people came in and they're like okay something different is happening here and just the energy at the front of uh my set compared to like the set before it was like a complete 180 from like people grooving to house music to like this whole row of like headbangers and i was like <laughs> hell yeah like we took over you know that's sick yeah i didn't know monster cat was based out of van yeah really yeah yeah, yeah. R literally where the block party is like that kind of railway uh area like near downtown east side that's where they have their offices yeah super interesting mm -hmm. i wasn't i wasn't aware of that yeah and you said you've been you were touring uh this year where, mm -hmm. where what have you been up to where that was again now? with whipped cream um yeah. went on her uh someone you can count on tour with her in montreal and toronto were the two days that i was on cool uh and those are two cities that i wanted to play for a very long time uh montreal especially has just an insane music scene like yeah. in terms of uh, Canada in general, I feel like Montreal is top tier. Some people would even say of all of North America, like I've heard from a lot of DJs really? for bass music specifically, like French Canadians love dubstep. Like they go crazy for that shit. And it's, I've heard that it's even better than like Denver and stuff. I haven't been able to experience that myself. Um, so I can't really compare the two directly, but yeah, it was amazing. It was just like such a cool experience. Toronto, I think was the better show actually. Really? Surprisingly. Um, and I think the reason for that was that uh, Caroline Whipped Cream had not played in Montreal before, but she had played in Toronto. The room was a bit smaller and she grew up there as well. So like a lot of her like childhood friends kind of came yeah. through and it was just completely packed out and the energy was super high. And that was like one of the most fun sets I've ever played. Like that was the peak of that like intimate kind of club vibe. Yeah. 
like when I think about the Monster Cat set, that was amazing too. But the, again, there was a little bit of separation. Uh, but in Toronto, it was like right up next to the people and the sound system was insane in there. That was just like, I, I think very fondly about that. That's awesome. Night. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's next? Are you, you got any more tour dates coming up? Anything coming through? Or are you just working on new music at the moment? Yeah, I'm more on the new music side of things uh, yeah. right now. I'm probably going to try to book some dates for next summer. I would yeah. love to go play more, but I'm in no real rush. Uh, I feel like I've been traveling a lot in the last two years and I'm kind of happy to settle down for a little bit and just yeah. write. Uh, I have been writing over the last few years, but and I have been building up like this stockpile of music and now I feel like I'm just need to go into like finishing mode mm. and yeah. uh, pump tunes out because I've been relatively quiet in the last two years in terms of releasing. Like I've put out maybe 10 songs in the last two years, which then if you look at like the album from three years ago, I put out 11 songs at once basically. Yeah. So I would like to pick it up again, and I feel like I have the amount of music to be able to do that with. I want to do an EP next year, mm. probably around my birthday. Uh, so that's like the main thing I'm kind of looking forward to, and then just kind of drip feeding singles up until then. So okay. yeah, how is uh, how is it touring? Because traveling around so much is it's so it's taxing, you know. Mm. And like uh, I, I recently just came back from like a huge trip, and I was so. It was one of the first trips I've ever been on where I almost felt homesick or I was like, okay, I need almost like a rest. Yeah. It was just so, so jam packed and mm -hmm. so much happening. And I mean, with, you know, you talk about a lot of energy going into your shows and into your sets. Like, how is it? Is it, is it taxing traveling around? And you must always be moving as well. So, yeah. Um, well, I'll say first that I've never done like a full, full tour where it's like 30 dates back to back. So I can't speak to that experience specifically. Uh, the traveling that I've done has been like a mix of tours and then just like going places to either see family in Europe, like like this last run. That was crazy where I was first on Vancouver Island for a week with my family. And then I went straight from there to Montreal for that show. And then after Toronto, I went uh, back to Vancouver for like four days. And then I went to L.A. for two weeks mm. uh, with Moon Sun and we were just writing music there. And then came back to Vancouver and then I went to Europe. Or no, I went to Toronto again for like 12 days and then I went to Europe from there and then from Europe I came back home. So it was just like an insane amount of traveling and the shows specifically, I feel like rejuvenate me mm. more than anything. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's why I said it might be different when I do 30 in a row, right? Yeah. But for now, like I feel like I get so much energy and inspiration from shows. The thing that tires me is like the traveling itself, like flying airports in general. I'm not a fan of, uh, but like, I love going new places. Yeah. I love, like, experiencing new cultures. I love trying new food. Like, just the whole once you're there experience, I think it's great. Um, it's so much, It's just, like, the flying in between. And it's something I want to actively get better at because everything I'm working towards is, like, to be able to travel more. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, planes, trains, and automobiles, man. It, it'll <laughs> yeah. really take it out of you super, exactly. super quick. Yeah. How uh, you went down to L.A. with Moonsan to, yeah. write, to write music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was it, how was it down there? Like, uh is he, is he down there these days? No, we, uh, he lives here. Um, yeah. But he used to live there. So he has okay. a lot of connections there, and so do I. Like, just It's just a hub in terms right. of like yeah. music people. There's just a ton of people who just live there. And so it's a really good place to go and like get inspired. And I feel like of all like the kind of markets I've been in, in terms of like going to shows, LA uh, of North America feels the most like educated in terms of underground music. Yeah. And you can get like a very wide range of new influences there by like going to like different shows and people get it like they've just been there for a, it's just they've had it for longer like if i don't want to call it like the europe of north america because it wouldn't make sense but it, in that sense in the specific way of like how long they've had electronic music for yeah and the knowledge of it like la feels like they're a step above in that sense um like i went to a sam galatry show down there i don't know if you know him no. it's old school soundcloud guy and me and Musa were joking, calling it SoundCloud Social, because when they like turned on the lights and the changeover, it was literally all artists there, basically. Like we recognized so many people, and we were just like talking to everyone. It was just all different producers, basically, who would come to this show. Yeah. So you won't get that anywhere else but LA. It yeah, feels yeah. like. Um, so for that reason, it was it was really enlightening in that sense. Uh, I do feel like. What was the point I was going to make? Kind of lost my train of thought. No worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but. Uh, I was going to ask you, though, because <laughs> yeah, that is the truth. Like, um, I listen to, like, a lot of Night Owl radio. Mm -hmm. And always, 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 it's from this place, now in L.A. From this place, yeah. now in L.A. From this place, now in L.A. 
Like, are you going to make that transition? Or are you, you know, you down to stay in the Vancouver and kind of develop the Vancouver music scene? Or mm. do you think you ever will make your way down to LA? Because it seems like that's where everyone makes their way down to eventually. Yeah, you know, um, I used to want to move to LA and I'm not like ruling it out completely. I might eventually do that, but I just love Vancouver so much. Mm. Like just in terms of like living quality and nature and my friends are all here. That in terms of all of those things, like Vancouver is kind of where I want to stay. But I, I like going to L.A. for, like, short stints to just work. Yeah. Because I feel like there's just such an ambitious energy there. Like yeah. Everyone is pushing for something. And you can surround yourself with the right people to have that here or anywhere. Um, but L.A., it's like everyone has that energy. You don't have to work that hard for it to be surrounded by, like, really driven people. Yeah. And I really like that about that place. Like, I just work very hard whenever I'm there. And so... I like going for like little short bursts. I've only ever gone like this last year was two weeks. And then the last time I went was just one week with my family. I could see myself going out for a month or a couple months, but living there, like I hear a lot of kind of negative stories from people who made that move and you can get lost in the city very easily. Yeah. It's very um, like, it's very easy to just party all the time, especially if you love electronic music, there's just always cool shit happening. Like every night, like on weeknights, you could find something dope happening on a Tuesday. Vancouver doesn't have that as much. No, yeah. Which could be kind of helpful in that sense that it keeps you indoors and like keeps you working. Focused. Um, yeah, focused. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's give and take. Like I love LA for the shows and for the people who are there. Like, And the people make the city, you know. So when I'm there, I have an amazing time. But it's also like America and I there's like fear associated with that. And I just feel safe when I'm here. So yeah. In terms of like actual living quality, I feel like Vancouver is unmatched. Yeah, fair enough. I uh, I've recently just spent a little bit time a bit of time in LA. Oh yeah. And I haven't I haven't quite gotten there yet. Like I'm like you say, people make the city. Yeah. And I definitely am looking forward to hopefully finding that at some point. Cause it does seem like a dope place and everyone mm -hmm. tells me it's great, but like, yeah, I haven't been able to really get in there in the right way just yet. So that's why I felt the first time I went to just yeah. with my family, right? I think mm -hmm. it was because it was a family trip, I felt more isolated with them. Um, but yeah, no, you got to find your people. That's, that's the main thing. Like when you find them, especially for music, I feel like there's just constantly like sessions happening and like even producers just like living with each other and just writing 20 mm. beats a day. Like that whole energy of it. I don't find that as much here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then something I was reading about you that you're quite well regarded for is, I don't know if it's right, sound design, but how you mm. how you mash your sounds together, how you use the, you know, organic sounds and then electrify them. I'm not sure about the, the actual technical jargon of yeah. it, but it, that seems to be where you're quite well regarded in the industry. Was that just natural or did you have to work towards that? Did you did you take any courses for that or was that just something that you had in you right from the beginning? Uh, I de definitely didn't have it right from the beginning. Like I was awful like everyone else right at the start. Um, but I've been, I've been producing for about eight years now mm -hmm. and I never went to school for it, but I have had like a good amount of mentors. And I think generally if I were to give advice, that would be the advice I would give is find good mentors mm. because that can just like accelerate your growth so much to have someone directly there that you can bounce questions off of and they can look at how you do things, your process, and kind of come in and either give you pointers or you can watch their process and see how they're doing things and you just take so much from that. Mm. And so that's what really exped things up for me early on. And anyone who I'm working with, whether it be as a mentor or a collaborator, I'm always looking at their sound design and yeah. to trying to learn new techniques and tricks. Because I, when I think about sound design, it's less so about the exact sounds that you're using and I think it's more about like processing Hmm. like how you take a, a sound and manipulate it into something new. And then when you understand the steps to take to evolve that sound, you can plug in any source material into that and it'll turn it into something new. So I think sound design is a lot more about like experimentation and finding the happy accidents. Yeah. Like just like knowing the processes to create, to, to kind of accidentally make cool shit and then just training your ears so that you know when the cool shit happens and you can like pull that out and like say that for later. So the ear developing thing, I feel like just takes a lot of time and there's no real way to train that besides just putting in a lot of hours. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm kind of answering this a very abstract way. No, no, yeah. But sound design in general, like my sound design, I feel like where I found my identity is that combining like organic sounds with electronic mm -hmm. and kind of blending the, the two in a way where you don't really know when the organic sound stops and where the electronic sound begins. And on my album is where I explored that the most. And the yeah. way that I did that is by recording a ton of live instruments. So when we were in the studio, we recorded piano, choir, 
live strings, uh, guitar, a bunch of synths, organ we recorded. Yeah, like, so just taking all this, like, amazing live recorded source material. And whenever you record anything live, there's so much, like, kind of intangible essence to it where mm. you can tell that someone kind of like played it and it's so dynamic and there's all these like background noise and all these things that kind of give it a more live sound which then you can take and process really heavily and when i say process i mean like distort saturate compress whatever and it kind of starts to become a synth mm. or something that sounds digital but it has this essence of live like like for example my voice like i use that a lot as like an instrument mm. To sing as well, but like just to do oohs and ahs or whatever, and then run it through like crazy amounts of processing and then chop it out to be like uh, kind of cuts. Like my song Consecration, the, the lead single from the album, the lead in the drop is my voice, like the, oh, yeah? the one going back and forth. Yeah, and it has so much like kind of interest to it and like pitch bends and like kind of natural intonations because it is a voice. Yeah. And the human voice has so many, like it's so dynamic, you know, it's way easier to make like a really interesting synth line, I think by singing it and then distorting it like crazy rather than trying to like make us like do it all by hand on a, on a synthesizer. It's just always going to sound more artificial that way. Mm. And so taking these like super processed versions of the live sounds and then blending it with the original live sound itself so that it's kind of moving in between both of them and you like kind of disorienting the listener, but in a good way where you're like, I don't know what's happening, but I like it. Like, yeah. That's, that's kind of what I aim for. And it has the humanity still. Yeah. And I think we've entered this really with like so much AI coming into things. Like we've entered this really weird spot where it's like we're almost losing the humanity in our art. Big time. And uh, I've had a lot of people point this out to me, whether it's these podcasts or the fun facts that I make or any content that I make. Like, why don't you use more AI? You can use AI to process this. Mm -hmm. You can use AI to speed this up. Like I cut these podcasts by hand and people think that's crazy because they're like, you can just use AI to do that. And I'm like, no, I want the humanity yes. in it. I want the little mistakes. I want that that graininess, that what what AI can't bring. Yeah, it's clean and it's fast and it's efficient, but it can't do it as good as I can. And you'll you notice that in the in the final product Absolutely. of things. You know, the the little bits of humanity that get left behind that that the AI just can't do. Definitely. You know? And I get asked about AI a lot for music things and like how I think it's gonna affect it. And I think it's gonna like cut out a lot of like people who are making kind of derivative music that's very um, like easily repeatable or already exists and they're just like kind of iterating on it. Mm. I think that's going to become a lot more like commercialized and very easily accessible. Like all the people who are doing sync licensing or like wanting to find YouTube, uh, music for their YouTube videos, like the ones who don't care that much are going to easily find AI music that's going to replace these people. But I think in turn, it's going to create a huge demand for like deeper artistry and narrative and story in music where it's, the song you're listening to is connected to the person who made it and there's a reason that they made it and there's a story behind it. I think there's going to be way more of a demand for that mm. of in this like sea of music that you can't even tell if it was an AI or some guy made it. There's going to be this like demand for something more. And so I think that like real artistry is actually going to come up as a result of it. I like that. I like that. And I, I completely agree with you. Like I love listening to a song and being like, what was the artist going through Absolutely. at this moment? And like, there's uh, like phone calls you wish you could almost make just to be like, I don't mean to bother you, but like what was yeah, happening yeah, in yeah, that yeah. moment? Like, oh, cause it hits you mm -hmm. so deeply. And you're like, I, I feel that. Like, I don't know what you were going through, but like I can, oh, I can feel it. Absolutely. It just gets into my soul. And I, I agree with you. Like that stuff's going to become more, more valuable as people just, you know, plug and play like, oh yeah, let the AI take it 100%. over. Here's, here's a track, you know, drop it off. But I, uh, I really hope it brings back real artistry. And, I think and, it will. I yeah. think it already is. I think like, like there's different things people value when they're listening to a song. I think generally most people care about lyrics and melody the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that for myself it's different. Like I don't really care as much about lyrics, to be honest. Like it can elevate an experience for me. If I already love the song, then I'll sometimes take that step further and be like, okay, what are the lyrics about? Mm. And it can make it better. And even melody, like it's kind of silly to say, but I don't care as much about compared to chords and production. Mm. Like this is like really what pulls me back to a song that I love um, is production. And like just how auditorily, how it feels in your body when you're listening to it. And then chords, I feel like chords are like the essence of the song and certain chord changes like pull me back again and again to to music so i think it depending on what you like desire 
out of music, like lyrics especially, if you care about lyrics, then AI music will never do it for you. Right. Like yeah. it's, it's never going to um, hit that nerve that you that you want hit. The humanity. Yeah, humanity, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think for people who like only care about a catchy melody, then AI music will, might just be what you need. And that's okay too, you know? If, if all you want is this like really kind of base level, surface level music, then AI will fulfill that need very well for you. Yeah. But yeah. if you're seeking something deeper, then I think... Um, you know, there's people out there that can deliver that and their skills, I would hope, are going to be more and more in demand uh, as yeah, time goes as on. as this stuff proliferates. Exactly. That's something interesting I was going to ask you because like 11th hour is, it's kind of crazy. You know, like there's a lot of crazy sounds, a lot of crazy bass noises and yeah. you're like, whoa, this is insane. And then you really have to switch it up for your for your live sets almost. Just like it, it they sound a lot different the yeah. album versus the live set definitely um what's that like like y you must have like a bank of music that you just keep for your for your live sets mm -hmm. and then you mix in some 11th hour stuff every once in a while or was that just kind of a standalone project that you were like i just really want to play with these crazy sounds mm. and these crazy synths and then i'll i'll play my sets as they need to be played well when i was writing the album i asked myself that question of like oh, how yeah. much do i care about um making these songs dj friendly mm. and the answer i came out with was not at all like this is the, taking even a step back further from that, like I feel like when you're creating a piece of music, it's really important to ask yourself, like, what setting do I want this to be played in? Not necessarily like that's the only setting, but that helps like guide a lot of the decisions down the line. Um, so for the album, I decided this is just like headphone music. Like mm. this is just for people to listen to on ho at home on headphones. And that was very freeing because I don't have to stick to like traditional structures anymore. I could do BPM changes, which like if you're making a song to be DJed, you can't do BPM changes. Like that's like a hard and fast rule pretty much. Um, but it freed me from all of that in a mm. sense. But I still wanted to play these songs live. So my idea was always to create remixes of these songs, yeah. both get remixes from other people, but also make my own versions that would be geared towards live and so they'd be a little bit more structured more danceable and the idea with that is you home, you're at home you're listening to the album and then you come see me live and you hear bits of the album in the live set so there's this like recognition there but it's twisted in a new way um, that you're only going to hear live you know to make that experience more special i like that it's a really well thought through process and you have this is, this is going to come out a little bit after we talk about this mm. but uh at Ast you've got an ad astra remix coming out on friday yeah or? yeah it's it's uh my own remix of it so exactly cool. what i was talking about we already put out a whole lot of 11th hour remixes yeah uh, about two years ago but i've been working on my own remixes of them and there's other ones that will come out too um i was hesitant to even release them in the first place because again it was just like a show kind of thing and i've been testing out the ad astra vip at shows uh, but this one, I just like fell so in love with it and I really wanted to release something before the end of the year. So it just felt right. And um, yeah, that's kind of going to come out on Friday. We're recording this on, what day is it? Tuesday? It's yeah, yeah Tuesday. <laughs> December. This will so probably be like January, February or something. It actually comes cool. out. So, yeah, it'll but, be out already. That, yeah, by people that point. can go find it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, it's been great to see how how far you've been taking everything. And I'm really excited to see what you've got coming out now, like what Thank you're you. what you're kind of sitting on and... When do you think you're going to see your next... You said for your birthday you wanted to release. Yeah, I tend to like releasing music around my birthday. It's kind of cool. easy engagement on the posts. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that'll probably be around when it comes out. Like I have all this music right now and I'm really like thinking actively about how I want to structure it in terms of another album or just several EPs. I'm kind of leaning towards the latter mm. right now. But by the time this comes out, this that might have changed. Yeah. Like even the album, its initial idea is very different from what it ended up being. And in general, I try to stay very open to like the project changing to become what it wants to be yeah. rather than my initial like idea of what it's going to be. Um, yeah, like even with an EP or whatever, like I'll write a track list and the album had a track list too, mm. like back in the day, but it, it changes like every month basically. Yeah. The order of it, which songs get cut or get added to it. Um, like even Consecration, the the first song on the album, that was the last song to be finished on the album, mm. the last song to be added. Like it was added like two months before the song, the album was even finished. So if you look at like the track list for the album, all the way through its creation, it never had consecration on it basically until mm. the very end. So I just, I like to keep it open ended in that sense. And I don't talk about my plans too much for that reason. Yeah. So that I don't want to like build up any expectations for anyone and they're let down. Like the music will come out in yeah. some form or another. Um, but I always like really try to take my time with 
a making it as good as it can be and then presenting it um, in a way that like gives it justice you know yeah I think that's got to be the best way to do it though like no no real plan no real schedule and just let it flow mm. like just let it happen and I think that kind of goes back to the humanity that we were talking about before where you know you can have these incredible ideas you know the, the shower thoughts kind of thing where you can just be having a walk and be like no everything's changing we're going to completely mm -hmm. completely switch this up and I think leaving yourself that space is probably way more important creatively than than locking things in and being like hey this is going to how this is going to go like this this yeah. is going to go like that this is going to go like this like allowing yourself that space to be creative and let it become what it needs to be is got to create a way better end product than if you were to be strict on it. Well, it feels a lot better, definitely, to be, to have my own control mm. over that. But it's not something you always have in music, like yeah, the spontaneity you... thing. Like when you're working with labels and that yeah. kind of thing, like there's hard deadlines and usually things get pushed back. Mm. Um, so like The Dark, for example, that song took four years to write in the first place. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, because it was originally going to be on my album. Okay. So it, I wrote it like a long time ago and... Uh, I was actually in Denmark, like working on music with a bunch of people there. And I'd uh, written that song like at 4 a.m. one morning cool. there with the uh, help of some friends. And then literally on that trip was when I correct connected with Whip Cream initially. Yeah. And she hit me up like to send her music. And I sent her the whole album or like the rough version of it. And she listened through it. And that song specifically, she was like, can we pull this off the album, make it like a collab between the two of us? Cool. I was like, of course. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. And then like 40 versions later, four years later, <laughs> You know, we released three other songs before that one came out, even though that was the first one we started working on together. Hmm. Right. We did like a bunch of remixes in between because that one was always just cooking in the background. And right away she wanted to get Josiah on it. But, you know, that's another big artist with a, a huge like kind of back catalog of deadlines and things that they're doing. Um, plus the fact that they're singing opera on it, yeah. which they've never done on a song on, on a release before. So there was just a lot of like steps to a write the song but then like get it signed to monster cat and get josiah's vocal on it like the music video too like everything took quite a, uh, a while and that's just kind of the nature of working with labels so i think there's some amount of like flexibility of when you're working with these huge structures to understand that they kind of move at their own speed and no one else's yeah uh and so that makes it really nice when i'm doing something on my own and i have full control over it and i can just be like on friday i'm dropping the song and that's it yeah I was going to ask you about that. How did you get connected with Whipped Cream? Because she's Vancouver. Uh, so she's well she's she? lived on Vancouver Island. It's the island that I'm, yeah. Okay, that's uh, what she I'm grew up in of. Toronto, but uh, kind of lived on the island for a long time. Uh, with her, well, I was a fan of hers before we we got connected. I was just a huge fan of her music. Uh, the first thing I heard was her song "Ignorant" that came out on um, on what's it called? Oh my god, I can't remember. Uh, you know the label Ausla, Skrillex's label course, that I have yeah. tattooed on my arm? Yeah. Uh, they they had this sub-label called Nest HQ. Okay. Which no longer exists. I would love for it to come back because it helped break a lot of uh, artists. It was like an amazing way of finding new music. And Whipped Cream broke out, I would say, um, like a lot of things, but definitely getting a release on Nest HQ. And that was the first thing that I heard from her. Mm. Uh, and I just was in love with her music and her sound. Like it was just so like minimal and hard hitting, like really well produced, but like her sound design was also very, very good. And so I was just kind of following everything that she was doing. And she would make these tweets of like, just send me music basically. And I replied once with my song Agony from like six, seven years ago. That's a real throwback for anyone who's listening that long. Um, and I remember she liked my reply and like not all the replies, but she didn't say anything. I was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. And then she made another one of these tweets and I sent her that song God Rays. And that was when I was in Denmark mm -hmm. and she, you know, replied to me and we fo uh, followed me and we started talking and kind of everything grew from there. It was very organic though. Like uh, I met her for the first time, like later that year at uh, this festival called Stacked in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was so cool. Like I remember also that very clearly because she played three of my songs that night and from Sick. like 10,000 people. And it, that was just like a very emotional experience for me to in my home city. Like a lot of my friends were there, didn't even know I was there and like were messaging me like, Sick. dude, I just heard your song. Like that was, yeah, that was a really crazy experience for me. I cried my eyes out and uh, yeah, just like thanked her for, for that experience. Um, and she has such an energy, like she really commands the space yeah. when she walks into a room. So I really like respect uh, her for that and her voice and like uh, the way that she kind of carries herself through the industry so she was always a big inspiration for me in that sense and just getting to know her more like as a person made me respect her even more and like just working on music together always felt like really natural yeah like it was just a very easy process and that 
always like it's really important to me because certain collabs it's like you're really like forcing it like it just yeah. doesn't sometimes it just doesn't work and that's okay too but with her it was always really easy really straightforward and i felt like the, the entire time that we were working on these other remixes on the on these other releases i was like oh the dark though like that's gonna be the song like yeah but it comes i'm so high on that track and it was like um at the time it was my favorite thing i've written uh, mm. and it's still like I, I still love that song but i remember that's the that whole like second build up. I was just like sitting on that for like four years, like literally be like, what is this gonna come, come on, out? Let's go. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, no, I'm super grateful to her for like everything she's, all the opportunities she's given me in my career, and I feel like I would not be in this place without mm. her help. Um, and you know, her project is an amazing one. I think it's gonna grow into a lot of like really interesting places. I think it's not gonna be what people expect. Yeah, but I think it's gonna go like way bigger than it is right now. That's very sick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I totally lost my train of thought there. I had, <laughs> I had something. Uh, like, oh, that's what I was going to say. There we go. I love in uh, like electronic music. It's super cool because so much is done on laptops and mm. iPads sometimes yeah. even like it's very cool how easily you guys can just float songs to each other and be mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm working on this. You know, what do you think about that? And just like transfer it, transfer it, transfer it. It, it allows so much collaboration like Absolutely. between artists. And I think that's such a. Such a cool thing in in the music space where people wouldn't have had in years past, where yeah. it would have had to have been like you have to come to the mm-hmm, studio mm-hmm. with me and the engineer and the producer, and it's it's cool how easily people can just connect now, like across the world. Even um, like you're saying, like she was just throwing tweets out there, like hey, send yeah. me some music, maybe we can collab, and like really worked out for you. And it did, yeah. I'm sure it's worked out for a couple other artists that she's been like, wow, that's a cool song. No, the the barrier of ent- entry for making music has never been lower. Like yeah. As long as you have a laptop and headphones, you can crack your software and like you yeah, can make yeah, anything. Dude, like, um, yeah. I'm not saying I do that personally. No, I don't, no, I don't advise ever, any of this. No, ever who pirated would? software. Who no. would do such a thing? That's you wouldn't steal a car. Right, right. You wouldn't download <laughs> a house. You know? like, yeah. Um, but no, that side that you're talking about of like collaborating with people internationally has been like I think one of the driving forces of what's like kept me in music for this long is the community that I've both created and like become a part of. In electronic music, like people in Denmark, like one of my best friends in in London, who I met on like a Twitch chat five years ago. Shout out to City Walker. Um, we made like 30, 40 songs together when I was like just starting out. And uh, we got to meet in Denmark with a bunch of other producers and just had like this amazing weekend there where we just wrote songs the entire time. And um, yeah, just all over the world. And it, you just send them a project, they send it back, and it's so easy. Uh, there is something to be said for that, like in-person collaboration too, for of sure. like being the able vibe, to bounce yeah. ideas off of each other. I feel like I can go for a lot longer when there's another talented person in the room, and we can just kind of bounce off. Uh, like Moon Sun is that for me? Like he lives here, so we just work together like all the time. And he's kind of similar in that sense too to Whip Cream, where I was just a fan before we were friends. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I, um, there's this guy uh, Jaren, who is another artist, and I'm obsessed with. Like he's like insane jerry and his his wife actually uh is in vancouver so he comes by uh now and he reposted one of moonsun's songs like i was going through his soundcloud or whatever and i heard this track I was like this is unbelievable like just yeah. so blown away it was uh, fear by amser and i hit him up on soundcloud we became like soundcloud buddies Sick. and he like kind of offhandedly mentioned oh i'm coming to vancouver like uh in a little bit and that was yeah like three or four years ago and we just became like really really tight right away as soon as he came we went for ramen yeah <laughs> sick. and just started writing music together all the time and that was like kind of yeah similar to the whipped cream thing where it went from like i was looking up to this artist a lot just for their music and then going to like meeting them as a person and like seeing that this is like a really kind of just normal human yeah yeah super down to earth and uh just connecting with them on a human level and the music becomes so much better to like the collaboration mm. process when you are connected in that way. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't need that to write a banger with someone. Like you barely need to know someone to write like a crazy track with them. Yeah. And I've had that experience too. So yeah, music is just an amazing thing for like connecting people. And uh, in general, like just being in a space with someone where you're able to put your shared attention onto something else and you're creating something. I feel like that's like, the fastest means of actually connecting with that person. Yeah. You know, like talking is great, but until you're like creating something together, like there's a vulnerability around that, Mm. that I think is really powerful for like deepening connections like quickly. And yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And it allows you a little bit of like insight into their brain, but especially that vulnerability. I get that a lot with uh, when I used to edit back in the days Mm. and there were only so many people that I would ever share that stuff with because it is such a, 
a vulnerable space, but you also like the way people give criticism is really important too. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they actually do like, for me, the worst thing is like showing a project to someone and they're just like, yeah, it's, it's good. It's yeah, cool. Yeah. And you're like, that's not helpful. That, yeah, that is thank you, but I'm never showing you anything again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I prefer the guy who tears my stuff yeah, apart and is like, nah, you got to take that out. You got to throw this here. Why didn't you have this transition? Why didn't you touch this audio? And you're like, oh, there you go. And like, that's way, way, way more helpful than someone just kind of patting you on the back. Definitely. So I, I definitely do appreciate that that aspect of collaboration. No, that 100% exists in music as well, where people are just like, yeah, cool track or whatever. Yeah. Uh, like, but I used to stream music feedback actually on Twitch? like Twitch yeah. and Facebook as well. Facebook was what it was popping the most. Like five, really? six years ago, yeah. Facebook Live. Yeah, yeah. I would True. go on Facebook Live and like people would send me tracks and I would listen to them live and like give my thoughts. Cool. And uh, that was a really cool experience. Uh, it's definitely a mix. Like there's the people who are like absolute beginners and you have to kind of give them more like kind of basic feedback just to get started. But the favorite, my favorite part of that was my friends coming in and sending me their tracks and just being, it was a way to like catch up on what all my homies were working on mm. and just being so inspired and blown away by like how talented my friends are. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that like I miss that a lot and I might get back into streaming for that reason. Yeah, yeah. Not just feedback stuff, but just like kind of, lifestyle and chatting and maybe some production things because yeah that that community aspect is something that is there with music but you can lose it sometimes because production is inherently a very like isolating yeah chat. like same as editing right yeah, yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. like in a room in front of a computer by yourself most of the time yeah. that's what it is and i feel like that's why the shows and the community aspect are like so rejuvenating for me because it's like a reminder of like the like at home it's just numbers on a screen but when you see like real people and you like connect with them a reaction through this art together that we all enjoy like yeah the reaction um that's when you like reminded that it's like it's still like humans doing this yeah 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 very interesting i get i, I don't get that side but i get comments more than anything else and like it's nice to read them sometimes and you're mm -hmm. like okay cool like people actually do like yeah okay this this is working for some people and yeah. they appreciate it and they enjoy it and like that's a really nice really nice side of things yeah, I guess there's no, like, real show equivalent for, like, the video space unless no. you're, like, going to, like, award ceremonies and that or, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, Like, at the highest level. So, yeah, that is interesting, it's, actually. It's nice every once in a while I meet someone on the street and they're like, I really like your videos. Like, wow, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Like, I really appreciate that, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's a surreal feeling. Yeah. It is. It's, it's, it's so weird, <laughs> man. It's so weird. Moonsong makes some crazy stuff. Yeah. Dude, he makes some... I don't even know what genre I would call that, but, like... He's got some crazy sounds. It like just that. exists in his own lane. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I could talk about Moonstar for a long time. I feel like I already have on this podcast. That's but all my, good, man. my guy is like, like, I mean, he's one of the greatest artists of our generation. I think, I think he's like, like the music that he has out right now is like five or six years old. So like, is it's it, not yeah. even like a great, it's amazing, but yeah. it's not like the best reference of like what he's making right now, which is like unbelievable stuff. So I would just say like, keep an eye out on Amster because that album is coming. Sick. And it's going to change things. Hi. Dude, I love every once in a while I get a story and I'm just like, my brain is exploding. <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? It's crazy. <laughs> so crazy, man. Well, you got anything else coming up? Anything else you want to get into before we uh, wrap this thing up? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I am dropping a lot of music. I, I, I want to say, though, that, you know, for people who have listened to my music and who kind of continue to support me, I just want to say thank you because I'm, I'm very like, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to like really practice gratitude. Yeah, a lot more like it just puts me in like a good kind of headspace yeah. and I feel so grateful for like the opportunities I've been given but also the fact that people like care yeah. about what I'm doing like that's kind of crazy to me like I've only ever really done it for myself like my own like joy of just creating something but seeing that like how it impacts someone else like really makes it like feel more significant to me like it's bigger than myself and for me, the reason I got into making music in the first place was like listening to songs that like helped me through like a really tough time in my life. Mm. And they're just like, um, it just takes you to a different place. It's an escape, but it's also like a real, like I love music that's like abstract enough that you can like kind of attach it to your own life experience mm. and be like, this song is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Even though it's not, and it's not what that person intended. Like for you, it is. Yeah. Right. And that's, that was always my favorite music. And I think, connecting back to what I said before is why I don't care about lyrics as much because I like it when a song is more open-ended and you can attach your own thing. The type of lyrics I really dislike actively are when it's like this happened and then this happened and then that happened. Like that's cool. You're telling your story or whatever, but I, I don't find relatability in that. Mm. Um, the type of lyrics I love is either so abstract that you can't tell really what's going on. Like Bon Iver, like he's my favorite artist ever or 
a very simple kind of riff that can you can just attribute it to a lot of different things. Um, like I just want to shout out my favorite albums real quick because on. number one is Bon Iver 22 a million. Mm. I think it's the best album I ever made. Um, I have it on vinyl, and it's yeah I love Bon Iver in general, but specifically the way that he like just writes and it's more about the sounds of the consonants, how they feel together as opposed to the literal meaning of the words. I really like, I think it's such a unique approach to writing lyrics. Um, and another one is Porter Robinson's worlds. Oh, huge, um, huge fan. Yeah. Just huge, incredible work. And fan. the opening song of that divinity is like, was my favorite song ever before I discovered Boney Berry. It's still up there in my top three. Uh, another good one, Alan Moore. This is a more like underground artist. No. Uh, he's incredible. More people should know about his music. Uh, it's an ri- Israeli guy writing, like, I would describe it as like Skrillex and Mozart, basically. It's like unbelievable electronic bass music, but with this hugely rich, like, orchestral classical side built into it. So definitely check out Alan Moore. Um, who else? I, th- I Those are really the top three. Uh, I mean, I love Skrillex too. Like, I have his. I want to see him live again, man. Skrillex? I, yeah, yeah. I, I saw him live way back in like 2016 in like Bali. Okay, um, <laughs> wild, s- dude. Super random story. We actually yeah. it was at Ultra. Ultra did a, okay. a concert in Bali, and I'm really sorry, Ultra. We snuck in, <laughs> um, dude. It was, it was such a wild experience, jumping over like walls and in a hotel in the jungle, but That's managed nuts. to like kind of like jump into the concert mm-hmm. grounds um, just before his set, and that was right around when Jack U mm-hmm. was huge and like. Still one of my favorite experiences ever. I'd really, really like to see him again. Dude, that's crazy because the first festival I ever went to was Jack U. Was it? Yeah, yeah. Like the year before. That project um, was so good. It was. Yeah, it was like a big part of my youth. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, Skrillex is the GOAT. Like he's just he's just the coolest guy. And I, like, from what I've heard from everyone who's met him, he's like super down to earth as well. Still manages to stay humble while being like one of the most famous people on the planet. Yeah. Um, and it's still like, like what I respect about him is he cares so much about the art form and the craft. And like so many other people who get to this point no longer make their own music or they don't care as much. And he just like seems to really deeply care about just making the best song. Yeah. And I admire that a lot um, for someone who doesn't need to do this anymore. Like he, he could do whatever he wants, but this is what he chooses to do. And I think that's really amazing. I've been loving seeing him like... He just seems to bop into everyone's live sets these days. <laughs> like you'll be watching a live set and all of a sudden he'll, he'll just, just like come, appear, over, yeah. come over their shoulder and pull something back and plug a USB in. And you're like, dude, where did you come from? Like, what were you doing there? Like he's everywhere all yeah. at once, you know? No, absolutely. Such an incredible artist though. I love the, like the new stuff he's been doing with Fortet and mm-hmm. um, Fred again. Fred again. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's crazy how he just keeps, you know, he really brought in that I guess, was he drumming, considered drum and bass when he first came out? or With Skrillex? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was like dubstep, bro dubstep, step originally. Yeah, yeah. But it's evolved so much from there. Like but that's, that's what I love about him is like yeah. his, he just seems to keep developing keep these new genres and new genres and yeah. putting out like very like future thinking and like new songs where you're like, what is this sound? Mm-hmm. Like, what am I listening to? I love it. But like, what am I listening yeah. to right now? No, I, he, his sound design has always been amazing, but I think what really sets Skrillex apart is like his phrasing and like the way he writes motifs mm. where he can get like a complete instrumental like stuck in your head. Like he's one of the only artists where you can like name one of his songs and I'll like know how the whole drop goes mm. in my head. Like I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about Skrillex and like they were like, oh yeah, like Kill Everybody really got me into it. And I hadn't heard that song for like six years, but it was I remember the bum, 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 ba da bum, dun, 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 ba na 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 Ba, 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 ba. Like the whole drop is just like framed in my mind, like so clearly, even though I haven't heard the song for like yeah. six, seven years. And there's not a lot of artists who can do that without lyrics. Yeah. Like, that's a really like rare thing to actually make a whole drop catchy on its own without without needing anything without more needing than any just the sound. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'd love to see him again. If ever I get the opportunity, that's where I'm going. That was another question I forgot to ask mm. you. What was your first big song that blew up? What was your first one where you're like, oh, this is, this might work? You yeah, know? it was like, God Race. God Race. Yeah. Um, and what was cool about that song was that it was a self-release. You know, I've worked with all these amazing labels, but that was just a song I posted on SoundCloud one day. Mm. Like, there was actually very little put into the promotion of that track. It just kind of caught on on its own. And yeah, for like the next like two, three years after. And even still now, people will come up to me and say, like, I heard about your music through God Race Sick. originally. So that was the one that like kind of changed things for me and it, it, I get, got my foot in the door with Whip Cream which led to Monster Cat led to releasing on Atlantic Records which is I so I feel like it kind of opened a lot of doors for me in that way and that song um, yeah I didn't even think that much of it like when I released it I was like this is just a cool track 
uh, and then that festival that I went to stacked with whipped cream, like she um, played that in her set, like the whole opening part. It's like hear my voice go oh, in front of 10,000 people. It was such a trippy feeling. Uh, yeah, it was that track. Yeah. Yeah. SoundCloud is wild for that. It's, mm. it's a little less these days because I Definitely feel like a lot of people less. are now like trying to blow up on SoundCloud. Mm. But like back in the day, it was. It was the golden era. Yeah. It was insane. Yeah. And like just how easy, like, you know, like you say, like no promotion, just like, yep, toss a song on there and then. Boom. It, it just takes on a takes life off. of its own. Yeah. yeah. And there were quite a few tracks that did that mm-hmm. back in the day. It was, um, was it the Branches remix of To Stay? There were, uh, I, there was I, a I, lot. There was a lot where yeah. it was just like this like golden era where like these crazy remixes would come out that mm-hmm. people just posted on SoundCloud and all of a sudden it was like the biggest song. It was in every set. It was everywhere. You couldn't yeah. escape it. And it just came from, yeah. Just from someone posting it up on SoundCloud. Yeah, I feel like that was back when like reposts actually had meaning. Mm. And that's what helped a lot is like a big artist would repost a track like from a lesser known artist and people would actually listen to it. Mm. Now the whole repost game is so like um, monetized and commercialized that it's like people don't really pay attention anymore. I think that was the main change that kind of made SoundCloud not the leading edge of that. It's still the best way to find like good underground music. But I feel like there's been a demand for like a new platform to kind of take the place of SoundCloud in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, because SoundCloud has cracked down on the monetize on the um, copyright thing yeah. a lot as well. Yeah. That's another big difference because yeah, sa- the remixes are what made it pop originally. So, I mean, until another platform kind of takes this place, I feel like SoundCloud, Spotify is the place, but I hate Spotify, man. All my, ha- all my friends hate Spotify. Like, really? What's, what's the, is it the monetization aspect? The monetization, even though like, I will say, I don't care that much about royalties in general like i don't think that's the way to make money from music is like getting streams or whatever like i see streams and like music online as like a means to an end that end being live shows right that's where the money is that's where the kind of direct connection with the listener is and i feel like that's the most like powerful experience you can give someone is live and so that's the goal like that's what most people i know are working towards in that electronic music space but spotify is just so predatory with the way that they um with the way that they like push music it's very much pay to play in terms of their like promotion their ads their playlists are like super gatekeepy in that Mm. way because that's like the main way to like get music out is um like to promote is to know someone who runs the playlist or to pay enough money like and i hate just hate that aspect it feels like it's back to like kind of radio stations controlling this back in the day where if you just know that guy yeah you can put your song in that playlist it'll pop right yeah and so I feel like SoundCloud was just like an open air market. Yeah. That, that's what I love about it. Yeah, it's yeah, very it democratized. Just, yeah, you know? yeah. Anyone could post anything anytime. Yeah. And it would pop because it was cool or it wasn't, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, and so, you know, I just wish, I just hope that we can get a, a new platform that will kind of take that space. How do you mean predatory? What do you mean by, what do you mean by predatory? Like, they're just like, um, there's this sense that they don't care at all. Mm. Like that, that is one thing. Like they really do not care. Like it's just about the money to them. Like they've just made a bunch of like very anti-artist statements over the last years. Like one of the things they said was uh, artists like the, like the two, three, an album every two, three year cycle doesn't work anymore for artists. You should like drip feed content once a month. You should put something out, which has been the way that it's worked on like kind of social media recently. Um, but I just feel like that's such a asinine take when you're like speaking to real artists who are like making incredible albums. Yeah. Like you should interrupt your creative process to just like drop something just so you have a bit of content coming out. Like it's, yeah. just, it's just a, it's like an anti-art statement. It's, yeah. it's the turning of art into content, which I think Spotify has had a big role in. There's other things like TikTok and Well, I was Instagram just going to say it's a, it's a TikTok Instagram model or yeah. like, I wouldn't say you, yeah, it's just like, yeah, people, it, it's still like now, 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 yeah. now. It's ta- and yeah. it's taken away from it, it being actual art mm-hmm. to it just being a monetizable... Just piece, like something. Yeah. Like it, It's gone so much shorter too. Like it's everything's gotten cut down so much and it's just about a moment. It's about a catchy hook. It's about a lyric, you know? And that's like, it doesn't bother me to some extent because it's not really the lane that I'm in. Mm. So I feel like some amount of separation, but I feel like Spotify as a platform embraces that whole philosophy because it makes them the most money. And like, because they're the leading platform of music, it ends up affecting how artists go about creating their art. So I think that's where it becomes like predatory, where it actually hurts the art making process. If all people are thinking about is 
um, am I going to get this into the top playlist or am I, is this going to trend on TikTok? You know, mm. there's something to that. Like if, if all you care about is short term success and short, like chase those things. But I think it's going to leave a lot of people think, feeling quite empty yeah. as creators um, and as listeners too. You know, if that's all you're being shown is these little moments, like it's just, it's just not lasting. I feel like, like there's yeah. going to be a lot of flash in the pan artists. I feel um, in both the TikTok space and in, and Spotify and AI, I think is going to affect that a lot too with it democratizing the whole like kind of lowest common denominator type of music. Mm. Um, I, I don't really know what point I'm making, but I just hope no, another no, platform I, comes in. And, like I, I, I hope things change. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, we've kind of seen this a little bit uh, through like artists talking on Instagram and TikTok about like, yeah, this uh, label said they wanted to sign me, but I don't have enough followers. Mm. Or they said, you know, uh, post on TikTok every day for the next 18 months yeah. and people will sign you. Like you. It's not so much about who you are as an artist or your sound anymore. It's how marketable you are, how much yeah. you have in a following or, you know, um, you know how many streams you can get. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so we've really lost art then. We're not, we're not talking about art no, we're not anymore. Talking about art. We're talking about social media stars, mm -hmm. essentially. And, and how much money can you make off this? And it is really sad because I do think like, you know, I look at like the old generations where you've got like the, the Rolling Stones and the Led Zeppelins and the Van Halens and whatever, maybe some bad examples, but it's like, what are we, what, what's our classic music going to sound like? <laughs> is it going to be like, Renegade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's like, there's not like, there's not, is, are we going to be listening to Cardi B like wop, wop, wop in yeah. like the retirement home or like, it's, <laughs> I would hope not. I, dude, <laughs> yeah. it's insane that we still have like young kids younger generations now like still listening to music from like the 70s and yeah. 80s because nothing's timeless There's anymore. No new classics. Yeah. yeah, nothing's timeless anymore. Yeah. It's just get it in, play it, get it out again and it's just very boring. You know, I think that music still exists if you like dig and look for it like in terms of new classics but it's not what the kind of tastemakers of our time are pushing mm. in terms of Spotify, in terms of TikTok. That's, they are the ones who control what gets seen. And they're not like actively picking this and that behind it, but it's the stuff that does the best in the short term that, yeah. that gets the people's attention. And so, you know, I think the people who really seek it out can find it because amazing underground music still exists and is being made every day. And that's what gets me like excited about music is like finding the new stuff that's being made every day. And that's why I don't listen to that much old music because I feel like it's been made already. Yeah. I'm like about like what's coming out tomorrow that's like going to change the game, you know? It's new, yeah. Um, but the platforms don't push that stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, unless it fits within their very narrow idea of like what is commercial music and like what is going to appeal to the largest amount of people, it, it doesn't fit that model. So yeah, I think that's the main thing I'm trying to get to is like, we need a new SoundCloud. Yeah. Something. And it did suck when like all the copyright stuff started coming about. Cause you're like, guys, this is the whole point of the internet. Yeah. Like this is kind of the whole point <laughs> of like a bootleg or yeah. like, like, Yes, I know I probably shouldn't have done that to that mm -hmm. song, but that's the whole point of what we're doing here. We're remixing, we're re-rocking. Like, and music's I, I, always been that way. Yeah, it's always like, been like, like even Mozart was probably borrowing from his neighbor, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sampling has always existed. It's been like such a core part of music forever Yeah. that I, I wish I wish things were more open in that sense. I, I, on one level, I understand why copyright things are as stringent as they are. Uh, but yeah, it was nice to have a platform like SoundCloud where it just didn't matter. Kind yeah. of. It was just a free market open yeah. bazaar. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Hopefully something comes by and we can, I believe that. Yeah. yeah. There's enough people making remixes that the demand is there. I, I would hope. Yeah. It's, it's gotta be exist somewhere. We just don't know about it yet. <laughs> exactly. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. It needs to blow start, up. Yeah. It'll, well, hopefully it won't blow up. Mm, like that's kind of like, exactly. the, that's kind of like the hopeful thing You're is right. like, where we just have like the, almost like the private little discord where it's like, this is where we do this thing, but like <laughs> no one sped it around. Like we're going to keep this nice and no, quiet that's good, actually. between us. And then uh, hopefully we can get back to these like super cool remixes where you're just like, what is this? And, and there's an energy to it. Like there's this whole wave of artists who came from that whole SoundCloud golden era, you know? Yeah, there were a yeah. lot and yeah. they were, they were amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully someday maybe. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, hopefully. Um, where are people finding you, Yashar? If they want to come listen to some music, come watch a show, where are they finding you? Yeah, Crimson Child on uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, anywhere. Just look up Crimson Child and you'll, you'll find my stuff. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll see uh, some new album or new EP coming from you soon. Yeah, very soon. Hell very, yeah, very man. soon, yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for coming yeah, in. Yeah, cheers, bro. Really appreciate Thanks it. for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah this happy. was fun. It was great.